and uh, economies, which is called COVID economics. And he's also co-founder and contributor to Vox EU. He will make some remarks on the theory of fiscal policy role as a tool of, to counteract the cycle. And he will discuss implications uh, for Europe. Charles has about seven to 10 minutes for his remarks. Following Charles, Prakash Lungani, who is assistant director of the IO and co-author of famous now book, uh, Confronting Inequality, How Societies Can Choose Inclusive Growth, published by Columbia in 19. We'll then spend another seven to 10 minutes talking about how IMF views are changing uh, about the role of fiscal policy and challenges of applying this new view to developing countries. And finally, Chiara Mariotti, who is a senior policy and advocacy officer on development finance at the European Network on Debt and Development. She was previously at Oxfam and Overseas Development Institute. We'll discuss whether the IMF advice on the ground has been changing. Chiara also has some 10 minutes. There'll be a panel following this and questions, and I will leave it. Uh, without further ado, Jason, the floor is all yours. Oh, great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to um, give this discussion. I'm both looking forward to sharing with you, but also Larry and I labeled our paper uh, discussion draft. We're in the process of revising it, so very interested in input ideas and criticism. I think it would be fair to say that our um, biggest motivation for this is um, the United States, but that we think that the general set of points are 100% applicable almost everywhere that you need to take into account interest rates in thinking about fiscal policy. The specific implementation, for example, what target you would have, I'll come to later, on um, real debt service to GDP, for example, uh, would vary from country to country. But trying to understand um, all of that, I think, would also be um, really helpful and valuable to me. Um, our paper starts from an observation that you know boggles my mind every time I show um, this same slide, which is that in the Clinton administration, and I was there working on fiscal policy in the year 2000, we thought we were projected in the United States that we were going to fully repay the debt over the next decade. At the time, the real interest rate was 4.3%. Now, we were projecting, sorry, this was in February of 2020, pre-pandemic for at least the sake of the macroeconomy. Um, it was then projected that the debt was going to rise to 100% of GDP over the next decade. And at the same time, real interest rates were minus 0.1. Um, I don't look at this and say this shows deficit and debt don't matter for interest rates. There's an awful lot of evidence that when your debt is higher, that drives your interest rates up. What I take this as saying is something happened in interest rates that were it not for the big change in the U.S. fiscal position, interest rates would have been even more negative in 2021 going into this um, crisis. And with even more negative real interest rates going into this crisis, that would have made it even harder to um, respond to it in a variety of ways. I think we're all familiar with the decline in real interest rates. The few points that are worth um, noting, and you know, and you can do um, Laubach Williams versions, you can do all sorts of versions of this, but in, in every one of them, um, the decline in interest rates happens everywhere. It starts before the financial crisis. It continues even when economies are largely recovered from the financial crisis. And we could spend a lot of time debating what the structural factors are here. Slower productivity, worse demography, higher inequality, um, and the like. What's important, though, is the gradual unfolding of this and um, the seeming persistence of this says we need to reevaluate what we expect for interest rates going forward. 
Interest rates are expected to stay low. Um, this is the 10 year treasury rate in the United States. The Congressional Budget Office's forecast from July, which is their most recent one, they expected interest rates to rise to 3%. The Congressional Budget Office, like all economic forecasters, has only made one sided errors on their interest rate forecasts for the last um, 30 years. The market expectation, um, which has been more accurate than the CBO forecast, at least over the last 20 years, is that the 10 year Treasury is going to rise to 2%. Um, the market actually thinks that there's a 72% chance that the Fed funds rate is still effectively zero five years from now. The Fed thinks it's raising rates to 2.5. The market thinks it's only going to get to 1.4. Um, the market, as I said, sees a 2% nominal 10 year rate a decade from now. Um, we're, I'm going to talk about uncertainty and the implications it has for our thinking about it. In some ways, I think that's the most important counterpoint and discussion in all of this. Um, but I'll just note that every time I show you US numbers, I'm going to be using the CBO interest rate. Um, so I'm going to be using an interest rate that I think is more likely to be too high than too low. Um, at the very least, I think the uncertainty, at least within a 90% probability, is roughly symmetric. Our interest rates are one point above or one point below expected. I think either one of those are possible. Now, obviously, interest rates have some chance of being 10 points above what I'm showing you and no chance of being 10 points below or a very low chance of being 10 points below. So there's maybe some asymmetry in the tails. Low interest rates um, famously um, lead to three challenges. Um, the first is less scope for monetary policy and recessions. Um, the average um, cut has been um, 630 basis points in the United States. If we think we'll be at you know, one and a half to two and a half percent, there's a lot less room. Obviously the ECB the BOJ couldn't cut rates at all in response to the pandemic. Um, there is unconventional monetary policy. One is a question as to how effective, and I think it's worth maxing out on, by the way, but there's a question of how effective it is when um, long-term yields are also quite low. And that unconventional monetary policy comes with some side effects. Um, increased financial stability risks from increased risk taking in financial markets and increased fragility for banks around their margins. Um, finally, um, there's a possibility of demand shortfalls in normal times. If I handed you a time series of US Fed funds rate and US structural budget deficit, you would look through that and say, oh, there must have been a big recession in 2008 and nine, because the Fed cut rates a lot and there's a big fiscal expansion. And then you'd say, oh wait, there was another big recession in 2018, 2019, because there was another big rate cut and another big fiscal expansion. Um, that needed to be done basically to generate growth. Um, it looked like you're responding to a recession. Um, Bull Simpson, if it had passed in 2010, and we've done some further work on this since the paper, um, the economy would have had a lot of problems over the coming decade. So the argument is that we're going to make is not that if you do a fiscal expansion, interest rates won't go up. That's what I think MMT argues. They will go up. That's good. That gives you more scope for monetary policy. It reduces your financial um, stability risks. And it means we can get more demand from the fiscal side, a better balance of our monetary and fiscal instruments than we saw in the recovery from the last recession. Um, low interest rates create those three challenges. They also create opportunities. Um, the first is the opportunity to use active fiscal policy. The second is to um, that they give us more scope for fiscal sustainability. And the third is greater scope and need for public investment. I'll take you through all three of those now. Um, greater use of active fiscal policy. I'm showing you results that Reifschneider and Summers did using the Federal Reserve's FERBIS model. 
Um, they show what happens to the debt to GDP ratio after a fiscal expansion. And the message is that debt goes up, GDP goes up even more, and so debt divided by GDP goes down. This isn't special to the Furbis model or to their particular paper. Um, there was a paper that Gaspar Obstfeld and Sahe, and I guess this is a lot of other stuff at the IMF, that had very similar pictures to this. I probably should have swapped it out um, for all of you. The OECD, using both their NIGEM model and whatever their other model is called, um, did this and found it held in almost every country. Um, Auerbach and Gardnachenko, who aren't you know, exactly the most deficit and debt-loving people in their Jackson Hole paper in 2017, um, did a somewhat identified VAR and found the debt to GDP and also um, default swaps um, prices. Um, indicated reduced risk after a fiscal expansion. So the broad message there is countries cannot afford not to undertake fiscal expansion or recession. I think there's very little controversy around implication one. That was the clear message the IMF is giving this time around. The other international organizations, um, uh, finance ministers around the world. Um, other steps that should be taken, um, you know, automatic stabilizers or automatic recession insurance, I think that's particularly important in the United States. In Europe, they have very good ones. The issue is that they effectively undo them and go in the opposite direction. For the United States, we need automatic stabilizers. In Europe, they need to let them actually do their work. Um, you can do those based on triggers and the like. Um, and then this will vary quite a lot from country to country. I think this one actually is one of the more US specific things we have. But the question is, can you increase demand in a budget neutral manner? So for example, expanded social insurance. If you have more retirement money for people, more money for their health care, more money for college, people will engage in less precautionary saving. That will ratchet up the amount of demand. So a paid for expansion and pay as you go social insurance systems will tilt the economy towards having more demand. Um, if you have a very generous social insurance system, you're probably for micro reasons not going to want to make it more generous. Um, if you're starting without a generous one, this is additional argument for its generosity. So the second point, um, so I think the first point is relatively widely appreciated. Um, where I think there's more debate is it is still extremely common to look at debt to GDP ratios to assess a country's fiscal position. I know I've done that myself um, dozens and dozens of times. I'm going to do it dozens of times in the future. I'm just always going to feel um, a little bit either guilty about it or understand that it's a shorthand that it's missing quite a lot. Um, so what are the problems? Debt is a stock and it's a backward looking stock. GDP is a flow. Uh, the net present value of US GDP is $3.9 quadrillion, um, according to the Social Security trustees. If R is less than G forever, and I think to assume it's less than G forever as debt continues to spiral up would be an unwise assumption. Um, but if that was your assumption, then it would be um, infinity. What does that mean? That the amount of debt that you have in most countries, something like a uh, one half of 1% surcharge on your taxes would be enough to asymptotically retire that debt. So the issue for most everywhere is not the stock because the stock is quite small compared to the stock. Um, and it's not what's happened to date, it's what happens in the future. And I'll come to that. But if you look on a consistent basis um, for the United States on a stock stock, here's the debt. It was 35% of GDP. Now it's 100% of GDP. So the debt tripled as a share of the economy from 2004 to 2020. If you look at what it would take to repay the debt, and for the denominator here, I'm using the Social Security trustees' projection to GDP over an infinite horizon. Um, this, by the way, is not the metric I would recommend countries use. So this is more of an analytic point. Um, it's stayed at about half a percent 
of GDP. So the US, and you see it, I'll show you for other countries, fiscal positions are as sustainable or more sustainable today than they were 20 years ago. Um, I prefer to look on a flow flow basis because a flow flow basis means that you don't need to make some heroic prediction about GDP for the rest of time. Um, we once again see this large increase in debt as a share of GDP, um, but real interest payments are falling as a share of GDP. Um, a comment on that and, and probably should have given you a slide. Um, real interest payments as a share of GDP or nominal interest payments as a share of GDP minus um, your rate of inflation times your amount of debt divided by GDP. Um, we, for this chart, happen to use a smooth measure of inflation. Um, I, think, uh, we, uh, I think this is smoothed over five years. Um, you could use inflation expectations or something else. Um, real net interest payments is the analytically correct concept to be looking at because it reflects the fact um, that you are inflating away part of your debt. Um, it's economically to have a nominal interest rate of two and an inflation rate of one as it is to have a nominal interest rate of six and an inflation rate of five. Um, technical aside, um, the right measure that we should be using for debt is debt net of financial assets. Um, those two have grown apart in a lot of countries over time for different reasons. And now that we're paying interest on reserves, it makes sense to look at government balance sheets on a consolidated basis. And so look not at net interest paid by the treasury, but net interest paid by the treasury plus the central bank um, in the United States that is lower than the headline number is. Okay, as I said, that was looking backward. Um, now let's, looking, let's look forward. Um, this is the US federal debt held by the public. Um, the baseline is one thing, social security reform assumes social security reform that's essentially required by the law, otherwise benefits get cut. Um, over 10 years, either one of those actually is stabilizing. You're not seeing any sort of spiral. As you go out past 10 years, um, you do see, at least in the baseline, if you don't do Social Security reform, the debt continuing um, to spiral up. Um, the, if you look at debt service, though, um, debt service continues to fall for a number of years as more debt gets refinanced at lower interest rates. It starts to rise, but even when it rises, it stays well below where it's often been historically. I, um, this is sort of a rough and ready um, point, but I try not to place very much weight on predictions as to what's going to happen 30 years from now. Um, the 90% confidence interval for debt 30 years from now is it could be twice the economy it could be nearly repaid. If you go back and look at forecasts from the 1990s about where US debt would be now, they had numbers like 200% of GDP um, being forecast. They're wildly, wildly off. Well, um, in the face of that uncertainty, I think you wanna ask yourself two questions. Um, one, do you wanna take a large adjustment that has a large fixed cost component to it in the face of uncertainty, or is there some Dixit-like opportunity uh, uh, value of waiting? And um, second, you know, how much can you adjust in the future or not? Some of that depends on the type of adjustments you want to make. If you think you're going to want to adjust the magnitude of your pension, you probably need to do that sooner. If you think you want to adjust your revenues, um, you can wait more to do that. But um, regardless, I think all of this says we need to be looking at fiscal sustainability, not in terms of debt to GDP, but in terms of something like interest to GDP. And we need to be more thoughtful about how we project that going forward. Uh, the third implication is that there's more scope for um, and need for public investment. Um, Blanchard points to R minus G being negative, should change how we think about intergenerational fiscal policy. Um, he also points out that R minus G has been negative for most of the time 
for most countries over the last 150 years. Um, from a demand perspective, um, fiscal expansions and recessions may improve the debt to GDP ratio. We talked about that. From a supply perspective, a low interest rate means that more public investments pay for themselves, unless you think that the market interest rate tells you something about changes in the rate of return to public projects. I don't see any reason why um, we should think of that. There's no equilibrium phenomenon there in the way there is with private capital. So going forward, um, I think we need to adopt new fiscal frameworks. Those new fiscal frameworks should be a combination of what's optimal, which is um, you know, something we don't know for sure. Um, we can't pin down exactly, but also something that's understandable that you can explain. You know, central banks don't have incredibly complicated targets and they're much more sophisticated than legislatures are in most countries. So you need simple rules. Um, some rules are really simple, like balance your budget, but that's incredibly far from optimal. So you wouldn't want that simple rule. Um, and you want rules that are achievable, that a country can actually um, stick to it. So um, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, you know, interest rates are dangerously low in the advanced economies. Debt is projected to be relatively stable, albeit as a high level. Real debt service is projected to be low. So more fiscal expansion is needed. I'm not just saying fiscal stimulus this year on a sustained basis going forward. The problem that a lot of countries face is interest rates and debt that is actually too low. The objective should be about growth and financial stability. That includes the avoidance of recession, investing in stronger long-term growth, and financial stability has a better mix of fiscal and monetary policy than we've had in the past. We propose a new guidepost. Real interest payments should not be rising sharply or projected to exceed. Um, this number is US specific. If I were in the UK, I don't know what number I'd choose, maybe 1.5. Um, if I were in um, you know, Australia, maybe I'd choose 1.25. Um, this depends to some degree on you know, your reserve currency status, the size of your economy, the perceived risk of repaying your debt, what you've done historically. But the first thing I'd look is look at where it's been historically for my country and try to understand what I think it could be going forward. And then we suggest um, three broad guidelines. Um, one, which I think is, is widely understood and used, which is temporary emergencies should not be paid for. I'm taking a broad definition of those. The second is long-term programs. You want to set up a new pension plan, they should be paid for. But you would have some broad effect exceptions around it, especially for um, infrastructure, investments in children, education and the like. And finally, that, um, and as I said, this varies a lot from country to country, the degree you can do this, improve the composition of government to support demand and efficiency. So um, I'll stop sharing my slides and just say, you know, summarize by saying, um, you know, I think there are still fiscal risks the countries face. I think MMT is an incredibly dangerous idea, this idea that you can just pick whatever interest rate you want to have in perpetuity. That is the route to financial repression. That really is the route to wild inflation. And that makes it impossible for a finance minister to do the tough job they have to do, which is say yes and no. So I think we do need a limiting principle. We do need some way to decide, You know, we only have this much space, we can do this, we can't do that. But whatever you thought was the right limiting principle to have 30 years ago, if you thought the debt to GDP should be 60% in 1992, if you're finalizing Maastricht, um, given what's happened to interest rates since then, if 60% was the right number then, it might be a number more like 300% is correct now. I'm not advocating 300%. I would not want to be the finance minister in Europe who went up to 300%. Um, that was a polemical argument that um, we need to rethink it. We need to constantly rethink it 
and do that with interest rates in mind and with it actually being a benefit, not a cost that you might um, drive interest rates up. Jason, thank you so much. This is fascinating. I'm going to leave the floor to Charles, who has uh, some slides. And uh, Charles, you have um, a short of 10 minutes for your remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to share my slides. Please tell me when they, they are up. Okay. Uh, while, they, while they come up, uh, let me thank you, the organizers, for inviting me. It's a privilege to discuss uh, this uh, very interesting paper, very challenging paper. Uh, and it's a pleasure. I have seen the list of uh, people online. I have recognized many good old friends. Uh, so, hello uh, to everyone. Uh, are you seeing my slides yet or not? Not yet, actually. Let's try again. Let me try again. Oh. Are they coming up? Yep. They are now slowly coming up. I can still hear people with their mics on and I know their names. So please uh, just uh, mute yourself. Thank you so much. There you go. So you, you have my slides by now? They're, they're, we got a screen up. We don't see the slides just of yet, but I'm sure we will. Remember before it took a minute, it's a bit slow, the system. I'll let you know when I can see them. It's um, that's slow. <laughs> oh, I just add that as they're coming up, I have a lot of interest in these topics myself, uh, having worked on generational imbalances for the U.S. in 2011 for the U.S. team I was part of. And then uh, kicking off the famous austerity reformation at the fund in 12 with the estimates of state dependent multipliers for the U.S., Europe, and Japan. So I really look forward to Charles' discussions coming up. We also have the slides, but I guess the time will be the same because if we try to load them so are we going to go into the same uh, slowness issues? Um, Should I start? Well, let me let me start slowly. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you start while well, this is? Uh, okay. So in my uh, in my little bit of time that I have, I will do two things: discuss a little bit of the discuss the theory uh, that uh, Jason and Larry have put forward in their paper and then uh, focus on the applicability to the case of Europe. Uh, let me summarize what I have to say uh, up front. Uh, it is a thought provoking paper. There is no discussion. Uh, there are lots of stuff and it was very nicely presented just now, uh, but it can be very easily misleading. And I have uh, a number of health warning to, 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 to present. The slides are up, Charles. They are now visible. So let me first stay, start with the notion of debt sustainability because we cannot talk about uh, these issues if we don't, if we are not clear about what we mean. Uh, the departing point has to be the intertemporal budget identity, uh, and that's uh, uh, Jason and Larry have that. Uh, and uh, we have a solvency uh, condition that I put up here that everybody knows, uh, of course, by heart. Uh, now, sustainability is, uh, as I understand it, is a practical ap approximation of solvency because we cannot go to the infinite future. Uh, we have all these forecast and uncertainty issue that Jason talked about and I'll come back to. Uh, so, there are as many definitions of sustainability as you want to approximate or manners of approximating, approximating solvency. Uh, a, a simple, very imprecise way of, of uh, summarizing 
uh, and I guess not too controversial, is that we want the debt ratio, uh, which is an issue that Jason raised, but let me focus on the debt ratio for the time being, uh, is not too big uh, at some point in the future. So it's vague, uh, but it's, uh, I think, a good starting point to discuss this paper. Now, uh, what does it mean not too big at some point in time? Uh, a necessary condition, which is uh, not sufficient, is that the debt ratio doesn't increase forever. So when I see the um, figures, these figures are from the paper uh, by Jason and Larry. When I see the figures where they show any of their measures uh, that they presented and that keep going up and up and up uh, through 2050, that doesn't suggest uh, sustainability by, by any division, de definition. Even the interest, real interest rate payments, which is a, a, a very debatable issue, uh, they keep growing. So everything that keeps growing forever will reach infinity, uh, as we know, and that's something we should worry about. Now, um, going back to the uh, debt to GDP ratio, um, I find this criticism very strange. Um, if you want to have R minus G, which is a, plays a, a big role in this paper, unsurprisingly, uh, you have to write down the uh, uh, intertemporal budget constraints with a debt ratio. That's where the G is coming from. from. Uh, so you have to be consistent in the way you want to, to argue. Uh, why here uh, the GDP is just a scale uh, measure? It is also uh, telling us about how much can be uh, raised as taxation, but it's a scale measure that like uh, GDP per capita or price earnings, uh, ratio, all sorts of ratio we want to use, it just makes uh, a lot of sense and it brings about the R minus G when you do the calculus. Uh, now, the proposal uh, by Jason and Larry is we should uh, look at the ratio of debt to the present value of GDP, uh, this stock stock uh, measure. Uh, but to be mild, to put it mildly, it makes no sense. Uh, it says the current debt, basically the argument, the intuition behind that is that the current debt uh, will have to be paid for through uh, the present value of GDP. So the whole path of GDP from now until the bitter end. Um, but the present value of GDP doesn't tell you you're going to be raising anything uh, or doesn't tell you anything about how much you can be raise, uh, raising as income from uh, GDP to pay for the debt, uh, you need somehow to have all the path of future primary balances or the present value of this path. And it disappears in the paper as if that's not something that matters. Uh, that's first uh, reaction. Second, uh, even R minus G is not sufficient to stabilize debt. Uh, you have to worry about uh, the uh, string of budget deficits or balances that will uh, take place between now. So this is very, I mean, this uh, the, the rationale for stock stock rather rather than stock flow doesn't strike me as uh, helping uh, think about uh, these things at all. Now, I also, so there is this huge discussion going on uh, for now two years about are uh, bigger or smaller than G. Um, I'm taking here on the left side uh, the picture, a, a figure from the paper by Jason um, and uh, Larry, which he actually uh, showed, that shows that real interest rates have moved, uh, or interest rate, or growth less interest rate uh, has moved considerably over time. Uh, so it's not, the, the, the situation when the interest rate is higher is not a unique event, uh, it happened a lot of time in the past and we have to think it may happen again. Uh, on the right, and more importantly, I've put on the right hand side uh, debt to GDP ratios over the same period for the same number of countries. Now, a key point of the argument that we are presented is that when R is less than G, the debt declines. 
more or less automatically because it's the first term in the equation. But there's the other term which has to do with the uh, budgetary balance. And the other term can play an even bigger role. And if you look at the right-hand side figure, you see no, almost no relationship. I know it's not uh, fa fancy econometrics, but the I will not see much of a relationship between periods when R is smaller than G or when R is bigger than G. Why? Because government go on uh, spending uh, and doing defensing spending. Uh, so the idea that with R minus G, don't worry, folks, uh, the debt will decline. It's not borne out uh, by, by the data. Now, there are big issues of, of measurements. Uh, just a quick, a quick uh, uh, remark on what uh, the paper says. Uh, recently, uh, Ricardo Reis has argued that we shouldn't look at the uh, interest rates on uh, government paper, but uh, at the marginal productivity of capital. Uh, and there is a whole reason, a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, and then it's a much, much higher than the uh, debt uh, interest rate, the public debt interest rate. So this whole idea that R is usually minus G uh, flounders. And there is also a nice discussion by uh, Jamie Galbraith, which is uh, directly addressed at the paper by Jason and Larry, where he explains why uh, th there are very serious in, uh, issues of measurement, just signaling it. Now, a few words about the Eurozone. Um, I fully agree with the strong point that Jason has made uh, that now is not the time to worry about uh, sustainability. So we do have to worry, that's the budget constraint. Uh, we cannot ignore it, but now is not the time uh, with the uh, COVID crisis, the deep recession, which is not going to disappear all by itself. Uh, there are huge needs for uh, support from the fiscal policy side, monetary, monetary policy is basically out of order. On top that, of that, it is true that R is less than G uh, for the time being, so supporting the economy is not a big deal or it's not really costly for the time being, I insist, for the time being. Uh, so there is no discussion with uh, one of the key implications of the paper. Fully agree with that, and it applies with full force to, uh, to Europe. But uh, still, there is a budget constraint. And if debts keep growing, and they have been growing over the last 30 years, then at some point in time, markets will worry. Now, here is Europe. Europe here is very different from the US. Uh, we've been in a debt crisis uh, in 2010, 2011. Uh, and, and the reason, as uh, Paul de Grau explained long ago, is that the ECB is not the Fed. There is an implicit guarantee on the federal debt in the US that the Fed will come to the rescue one way or another. There is no such guarantee in the ECB, and that's exactly why we had a crisis. Uh, so there is a budget constraint, at least for Europe. Uh, now, the other reason why we have to worry about these things and about sustainability is uh, we have the Stability Pact, uh, which has been suspended as soon as the uh, COVID crisis came until the end of 2021. And we know the Stability Pact hasn't worked well. At long last, uh, the Commission has agreed that it needs to be thoroughly thought, uh, thought through again. Uh, so we have now a few months uh, to, to think what we are going to do with the Stability Pact. Uh, either it is fixed uh, way before the end of 2021, or we are going to be back with a deeply flawed rule that has forced austerity at the wrong time uh, a decade ago, and that's something we want uh, to avoid. So uh, the, it's time to explain to policymakers what a good rule looks like. We need to have a rule because we have uh, a debt sustainability issue. And let me, uh, and I think that's uh, my last, well, next to the last slide, uh, say a few things. First, the US, ex for the, from the European point of view, the U.S. experience and the reasoning we were presented with um, is, is irrelevant for Europe uh, in terms of fiscal rules or how to deal with that sustainability. Uh, there have been a few rules tried over time, 
uh, in the US at the federal level. And there is a beautiful paper by Alan Auerbach uh, explaining how uh, these rules have failed over and over again. Even the pay as you go, which is what uh, Jason and, and Larry are suggesting for current expenditure, it never worked. Uh, and the reason is that they were, the, the rules were washed out by Congress anytime they were binding. In the US, of course, there are state rules, but they are extremely poor because they basically block stabilization. And we see uh, the problem uh, surging now uh, with the COVID crisis. So I don't think we should start with the uh, intuition that's coming from the US. What's wrong with the stability pact, uh, which we need to reform or change? Uh, it's a complex mix of arbitrary and largely incompatible rule, 3%, 6%, expenditure rule, and so on and so forth, adjustment, the constraint that just is, is such a mess, it can't work. Uh, and uh, our experience with this pact for more than 20 years now is that it has delivered pro-cyclical fiscal policies, so something that Jason and Larry don't want to hear about for the right reasons, but that's what we have. And it has delivered uh, a huge debt crisis, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So that's what we don't want to get back to. Now, I have written a lot about what a good, look, a good rule could look like. like let me just uh, summarize it in three key principles. We need a target, like central banks, we need a target. And that's to be, that has to be the debt ratio in the long run. And we need to be doing computation like the CBO. There is uncertainty and come back to that in a minute. We need to have a clear instrument and that's the whole path of primary budget balances until uh, as far as we want to look. And we need an enforcement mechanism uh, which has been totally absent in previous US rules, uh, which hasn't worked under the stability pact. I won't discuss it here. Now, I'm sorry to say, but I, to Jason, that this paper I, will not help. First, promising that R minus J is going to be negative for as far as we can go is the wrong starting point. As I've mentioned before, there is no strong empirical basis. It happened and it didn't happen uh, for that. And more importantly, just a few years of R minus G positive coming after a, a few years of R minus G negative can be enough to trigger a bad equilibrium. And bad equilibrium, I mean here, we have many equilibria on the budget process, and we saw Greece and Portugal and Ireland switch almost overnight uh, from a good equilibrium to a bad e equilibrium. And now let me make a comment on the, the figures that uh, Jason used uh, to uh, illustrate the problem of saving, but he was looking at the confidence interval and say, oh, it's very big, so let's not worry about it. Well, I worry that there is a 5% probability that we are above the confidence interval. There is also a 5% probability that we are below, but if we are above, and if we go to 200% of GDP or higher numbers for a number of European countries, then, then we have a serious uh, debt crisis on our hands. Uh, and of course, the markets will not wait until it happens. They will move beforehand. So uh, this, this relaxed view about, oh, don't worry, R minus G is negative now, nothing can happen, uh, is just totally, uh, totally misleading. Um, now, the, there is a proposal uh, which is very attractive to, to say, just look at interest payments and make it a, a guidepost and, and Jason proposed 2% of GDP. Um, that, that I, I think is, is very dangerous. If Europe were to avoid that, uh, now that the interest rate are, are, are very low, the real interest rate is negative. Uh, that would give the completely wrong, uh, incentive or the good, wrong reasons on how to deal with the uh, uh, debt sustainability problem. We have to go into details of the proposed computations to, for that, uh, this uh, uh, taking uh, away uh, uh, inflation times previous debt. It's, it's, it's an unrealized uh, capital gain on past debt, uh, but it's not realized, it's not bringing any money anyway. I don't want to, do, to argue further on that. Further, Jason and, and Larry propose a sort of 
the golden rule where take away investment, public investment, uh, and look at the budget balance without that. Uh, we call that golden rule in, in, in Europe. Now, I can assure you, if you take public investment out of your computations, because it's supposed to pay for itself, uh, which may be true, and I, I have no argument about that, but I have an, a, a practical argument that every single item of public spending will be quickly labeled as profitable investment. Take defense. Man, it's usually the thing where we, the one item we say it's not uh, productive at all. Well, I can make the argument for half an hour if we don't have a good defense, uh, we'll be invaded and we'll lose everything. Uh, so defense spending is, is, is a public investment and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know what happened. I think that was the end of my presentation uh, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Charles, thank you very much. Very uh, stimulating point you just raised. Um, I'll give Jason a chance to come back, of course, but first let's go to uh, Prakash who has um, some slides as well. I would like to talk about the IMF changing views on counter-cyclical role of fiscal policy. Prakash. Not visible. Prakash, you are muted. Still muted. We can see the slide. Okay. Uh, you can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so thanks very much to Jason for giving our webinar series for the year such a rousing uh, start. And thanks to Charles and uh, Kiara as well. Um, in a couple of weeks, we have Jeff Sachs coming January 28th. So please save the date. So uh, this is a gr very enjoyable paper by Furman and Summers. They've taken some ideas that have been in the air for the past decade, uh, some of which they have floated themselves in previous work, and they've uh, amalgamated them to make a powerful case for reconsidering how fiscal policy should operate in the decade ahead. Uh, what I'll do is to just describe the evolution of the IMF's views on fiscal policy over the past decade. Um, so perhaps we can discuss if there is some congruence or lack of it between the Foreman Summers views and the IMF's stance. Okay, I'm trying to uh, advance my slides. Okay. So um, in January 2008, the New York Times saw fit to print a, a story about the IMF's changed stance on fiscal deficits. In the academic literature and in policy circles, this is considered to be the first of three turns the IMF made on fiscal policy uh, over the decade uh, that followed. So in drawing, uh, in, in putting together this presentation, I have drawn uh, on the academic literature cited below, uh, but also on a very nice book by Ben Clift, who I believe is in the audience. Uh, he had a book on IMF and austerity that I have drawn on extensively. So in this literature, the IMF is viewed as first moving towards uh, stimulus. This was in 2008. This is sometimes referred to as new fiscalism. Then in 2010, uh, the IMF is viewed as, as moving back towards a more traditional stance, uh, but not completely. This is referred to in the literature as new austerity. And finally, in 2013, uh, the IMF is said to have kind of re recalibrated its position and achieved what I'm calling a, a new balance. So. This is also broadly the view that the IEO uh, took in its 2014 assessment of the IMF response to the global financial crisis. When speaking about fiscal policy, the IMF characterized it also in these, uh, in terms of these three turns, it called the turn towards stimulus, timely and influential, 
with the benefit of hindsight, it assessed the turn back in 2010-11 towards austerity as uh, premature. And then it recognized that as time progressed, the IMF recalibrated its position and uh, sort of achieved what seemed like a, a, a good balance. So in 2008, um, the IMF's managing director at Davos called for a, a big uh, global financial stimulus. Uh, there was a lot of work at the IMF over the course of 2008, culminating in a staff position note that called for a timely, large, lasting, diversified, contingent, collective, and sustainable fiscal package. Um, and in 2009, the WIO uh, supported this view. Now, over the course of 2010, things started to change. Views in the policy circle started to change. Um, many felt that the worst of the crisis was over and that, that they were seeing the green shoots of recovery. Uh, the G20 gave a steer that countries should start uh, thinking about moving back towards uh, uh, fiscal balance, and they should, uh, as noted here, commit to having fiscal, fiscal deficits by 2013. Uh, and key European players um, also expressed the view that uh, Europe should uh, move back towards uh, a more balanced fiscal stance. So these views were also echoed by uh, the IMF uh, in the inaugural issue of the new flagship, the fiscal monitor. Uh, the IMF said that fiscal strategies should aim at gradually but steadily and significantly reduce public debt ratio. Uh, the euro area article four called for immediate action to establish fiscal sustainability. It didn't move back all the way because the IMF continued to emphasize caution. Uh, it said what is essential is not so much phasing out fiscal stimulus now, but offering more credible medium term plans. So in that sense, this was a turnaround, but not all the way. And another important thing that the IMF emphasized during this period was that it did not believe that austerity would be expansionary. So there was a famous chapter in the wheel that asked, will it hurt that it was austerity? And the answer was yes. Uh, the answer was that fiscal con consolidation in the short run would have a fairly contractionary effect on output. Now, in 2011 and 12, the IMF started to recalibrate its views because it noticed that the recovery was, was fairly tepid. Uh, the IMF also noticed that markets, which this thought were calling for active fiscal consolidation, seemed to react badly when the fiscal consolidation le led to uh, lower growth. Okay. So the IMF started recalibrating its position, and it appears that by 2013, by the time of the spring meetings, it had succeeded in somewhat recalibrating its position, um, at least if we judge it by the public perceptions of uh, IMF views. So people in this audience uh, know that the Post, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal rarely agree on anything. But uh, in mid-April 2013, they both agreed that the IMF had turned back and renewed its push against austerity, which is what the headlines of these articles tell us. Now, what are the elements of this IMF's new balance since 2013? The uh, aspect that has gotten the most attention has been that the IMF, as a result of using more realistic fiscal multipliers, has been much more has become more cautious about the premature and hasty withdrawal of fiscal support. So this was noted in papers by uh, Nicoletta and co-authors in July 2012. And then in a famous box in the wheel uh, by Blanchard and Lee. And the conclusion was that fiscal multipliers can be quite large uh, around uh, turning points in the economy, 
So at the trough, you have to be careful about what the estimated impact of fiscal contraction will be on, on output. So as I said, that is the aspect that has gotten the most attention, but there are many other aspects of the IMF's sort of new balance on fiscal policy, many of which have elements in common with Furman Summers. Uh, the first one, which has the most elements in common, I think is the IMF also started to draw out the implications of a low interest rate environment. And there are many papers, some of which uh, Jason cites in his, in his, in, in his work, um, that looked at what was driving uh, interest rates over time. There were papers that were assessing whether this low interest rate environment would continue. And as Jason and Summers do, then drawing out the implications that if this low interest rate environment was expected to continue, then compared to previous expectations, um, countries may have more fiscal space than previously thought, and that debt to GDP ratios could be allowed to go higher than previously thought without risking uh, sustainability concerns. And as with Jason Fermer, uh, uh, with Furman Summers, uh, there was an increased call for infrastructure spending to take advantage of this environment of low, low interest rates. The IMF has also recalibrated its views on many other aspects uh, on taxation. It's done some bold work uh, about avoiding the race to the bottom, about increased taxation of the rich. Uh, for EMs and LICs in trying to apply these principles that we've been talking about to emerging markets and low-income countries, the IMF has tried to enhance its debt sustainability frameworks in a way to allow for growth um, without necessarily being overly concerned about debt if 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 some of these aspects that we've been that we've been talking about uh, can also be set to hold for these countries and the imf has shown an increasing concern with distributional consequences of austerity a topic uh, that is very close to my own heart and uh, actually jason discussed our book at the peterson institute on uh, confronting inequality, including how austerity contributes to inequality. Um, let, me, let me close with the present. Uh, what are IMF staff views uh, at the moment? Uh, when the pandemic hit, the fiscal monitor in April 2020 called for um, a strong fiscal stimulus in, in all countries. Um, there was not a New York Times story expressing surprise at this, at, at, at this IMF view, so it, it shows how long, how far the IMF has come in 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 uh, positioning itself and in having a different view on austerity than uh, ten years ago. Um, and in October 2020, which is the latest fiscal monitor that we have, uh, the IMF has emphasized the importance of not pulling the plug of fiscal support too soon. And it has made the case for public investment, uh, just as in the Furman uh, Summers papers. Okay. And again, uh, the Guardian and the Financial Times don't always agree on things, but uh, it appears that they agreed on what message the IMF was sending. And they both had stories um, on the same day with relatively similar headlines they read the IMF as saying austerity is not inevitable. Now, of course, if you read the fiscal monitor itself, uh, the IMF has a very broad membership. It, of course, has to draw policy advice, not just for advanced economies, which is what Jason and Charles have been speaking about in large part, but for emerging markets and low-income countries, the IMF recognizes that some of the fiscal space and freedom available to advanced economies will not be available to emerging markets and low-income countries. The fiscal monitor desc describes options that may be available to these countries on how to support their economies with fiscal policy despite these tighter financing constraints. One avenue it advocates is higher taxes for the more affluent groups and profitable firms uh, in these societies. Okay. So let me stop here. We don't know what a future IEO assessment of 
IMF fiscal policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic is going to say. Uh, I don't know what it will say. I will probably be gone by then. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Let me try to stop. I hope not on your last point. <laughs> Prakash, thank you so much for this. Uh, uh, let me try to stop sharing first. Yeah. Yeah, okay. for, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, panoramic of the IMF pivot on uh, advice. And let me go to Chiara. Chiara Mariotti, you got a few minutes. We're trying to rush a little bit now because we want to give Jason a chance to fire back. Thank you. Sure, I, I will try to be quick, um, but first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a real honor uh, to be with you this evening. Um, I, I guess I'm here to represent the um, voice of the civil society and bringing a bit the perspective of um, developing countries, uh, which has been missing a bit from, from this discussion, and also to um, remember what is going on in practice and, and on the field. Um, I work for Eurodad at the moment. I used to work for uh, for Oxum, but I've been watching um, the IMF for a few years, um, in particular what it was doing and saying on, on inequality and, of course, more broadly on, on fiscal policies and public spending. And, and it's undeniable that there's been a huge shift in, in the things and in the rhetoric that the IMF has on, on these issues. And it has been great to see this shift and it has been incredibly useful for campaigners, for progressive campaigners at the national level. Um, if possible, in 2020, the IMF rhetoric has become even more progressive, um, as, as Prakash was reminding us, uh, with speeches by Georgieva, with blogs, research papers, um, advocating for larger use of fiscal policies, uh, pointing to the relationship between inequality and COVID. Um, incredibly useful uh, material and important messages. And yet it seems that the gap between the rhetoric and, and the practice has become larger because if, if this rhetoric narrative messages have become more progressive, the practice has pretty much stayed the same. And, and we have seen this in 2020. As civil society, we have been watching it a lot in what has happened in with, with the COVID response. And of course, the fund has been um, incredibly effective and fast in responding um, to the emergency with providing a um, large number of emergency loans. Um, Georgieva pledged one trillion, uh, dollar um, in, in lending capacity at the beginning of the pandemic, and, and all of this is undeniable. Um, but um, the work that Eurodad has done, but also others such as Oxum, in, in looking in detail at what these lending agreements are about, what they have, uh, well, what we have found is pretty much all of them um, expect countries to be implementing austerity from 2021, um, meaning now. Um, we, we have a study that we did between September and October that review um, lending agreements for 80 countries. We found that in 72 of them, uh, countries were expecting to begin fiscal consolidation from 2021. Um, there were 40 out of these 80 um, which had to cut public expenditure in order to be able to afford uh, COVID-19 response packages, very much underscoring the inability of the uh, multilateral um, community to respond with grant financing to countries in, in need and in distress. And um, we also had 59 countries um, that have fiscal consolidation plans for the next three years, which are larger than their COVID-19 rescue packages, and which are larger than their um, public expenditure on health. So this is very much the ghost of austerity, which is uh, haunting uh, these uh, loan programs that are being done right now. And, and very much there is the impression that 
what is being said um, by the IMF, by the OECD recently in terms of the importance of fiscal policies and, and maintaining public spending in a time of crisis only holds for developed countries, not so much uh, for emerging eco economies and developing countries. Um, I, uh, a few more things that I wanted to mention. Um, uh, a lot of these loan uh, lending agreements came in the form of um, um, RCF, RFI, all these acronyms, which pretty much, <laughs> well, they are important because they mean that they're lending agreements which don't come with conditionality. So all of these are um, projections with not that don't correspond to uh, binding conditions for the moment. However, a lot of these countries are in fact already at risk, high risk of that distress. Um, we found that um, 55 of them in a few years will have higher, le dev higher levels of debt and of debt uh, service payments, not lower. And so what we can expect is that many of them, possibly most of them, will be embarking in long-term uh, lending agreements probably from this year. Um, lending agreements that in this case, yes, will come with conditionalities. And, and so to, to conclude, um, I, I, I think the key message that, that I, I want to send this evening in, in the context of this discussion is that this is an extremely important year. 2021 is opening a decade that is, is being incredibly important um, for for the future of our planet, uh, for the achievement of the SDGs, and what the IMF is going to do this year, and what is going to ask countries to, to, to do is, is going to be critical. So it really has the opportunity to close this gap between the rhetoric and the practice and show that it's a different institution from the one that um, was um, came out of the um, global financial crisis. And key things that need to do to demonstrate it is, of course, first of all, don't ask countries to embark in fiscal consolidation uh, in the aftermath of the crisis. Um, don't expect it to happen until the crisis is well over and, 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 and countries can do so without starting to cut essential public spending. Um, it, it also it, it needs to um, continue and, and streamline the work that it has started to do on macro critical issues, so inequality, gender, climate change, just been an extremely important work, um, but that until now we have only seen in surveillance, not streamlined in, in known programs and in conditionalities. So this is the moment to be brave and start bringing these issues into, into that. Um, what would be great to see is um, a stronger and more transparent fiscal um, monitoring system of indicators of debt distress, but uh, put together with indicators of um, with fiscal targets and then um, monitoring of public spending. Uh, which clearly shows where um, public spending is being cut and in, in what areas. And then, of course, it would be great um, if it finally acknowledged that for some countries that it's unsustainable and that the solution is a compre comprehensive um, debt relief initiative that also involves uh, debt cancellation. I will yeah, stop here. This evening. Thank you very much, Kara. That was uh, very uh, fruitful, I think, for everybody to listen to. We have a number of questions in the chat, but I want to give the floor to Jason. We may not have time for questions. Uh, let's see how uh, how it goes. We need to close start by two fifteen. So, Jason, please. Oh shoot, two fifteen. Yeah, I I confess, I think I'm going to take all that time, um, and I'm going to reshare my screen. Um, I love what Tiara said. I love what Prakash said. Um, I found a lot of what Charles said interesting, and that is what I'm going to respond to. Uh, 
Um, one, on debt sustainability analysis. I think, Charles, that you were um, speaking quickly here, either a little bit confused or a little bit um, misleading on debt sustainability analysis. Um, for some reason, my pen is not working, so I may have problems here. But let me see if I'd rather write it out, but I can't, so that's fine. Um, the first point is you gave the debt sustainability equation. That says your debt is sustainable if it's 500% of GDP or 2,000% of GDP, as long as it's not rising. It provides no guidance at all about where to stabilize the debt to GDP. That is such an important question. And our point is that the answer to that question is different today than it was 30 years ago, and that you can't answer that question without looking at interest rates. Second, um, I think you did misstate this. When R is less than G, no matter what primary deficit you have, your debt will stabilize. Your debt will stabilize at something equal to your primary deficit divided by R minus G. So that something is rising doesn't mean it's unsustainable. If R is less than G, it is sustainable. It's just a question of where it's going to be sustained. I'll get to, I'm not counting on R minus G being negative forever. And I think that was an important point. Um, third, you didn't defend the debt to GDP. You talked about the problem of being forward looking. That's a problem with the stock stock perspective. That's also a problem with the stock flow perspective. Anything that has debt as your primary object of interest is missing all of the future primary balances. So nothing you said, I think, resuscitated the concept of debt to GDP. Um, nothing you said said that that was relevant for understanding sustainability or could be thought about the same way over time. Then um, let's look forward. The issues with looking forward are partly the uncertainty, but partly what do you put into your primary deficit for education spending eight years from now? Governments decide their education spending every year. Governments often adjust their taxes from year to year. In some sense, your future primary path is what you want that primary path to be. You can raise taxes a little, cut taxes a little, and then there's the additional uncertainty. Uh, my next point is, I don't think R minus G is gonna be negative forever. If I thought R minus G was gonna be negative forever, then the right answer would be to be running massive, massive, massive budget deficits and massive, massive, massive amounts of debt. It would be a huge mistake not to do that. The fact that I don't think that's going to happen, and I'm not trying to reassure or assume to anyone that that happens, is precisely why I think you do need a limiting principle and why you shouldn't let your debt grow um, to infinity. That limiting principle has built into it a reaction function of interest rates to debt and also actually of growth to debt, and that's what motivates it. So the question then is, you didn't give us a reason to understand why the debt of 50% of GDP, 100% of GDP, 500% of GDP, which one of those was the right to stabilize? They all worked in your system. I'm giving us a way to think about that, which is by looking at the flow side. And by the way, not just the flow side, the present projecting it forward. So, you know, I had negative real interest payments for GDP in the current year, but I'm looking forward over the next couple of years. So um, to interest rates being more normal. Finally, does this apply to Europe? Yes. Um, not 100%, 80%. Um, Europe has been, um, if it, the Maastricht Treaty was right in 1992, something very, very different is right now. Um, interest rates in Europe are actually lower than they are in the United States. You know, Portugal is able to borrow substantial amounts. Yes, you can have the Greek crisis um, and the like. This is not a, you should fudge your numbers, have your debt rising rapidly, um, et cetera. You want to apply this a little bit differently in different places. Certainly not saying the pay-go rule is right for every country, but the mentality that you need to reconsider the way you think about fiscal policy um, is absolutely, if anything, I think more important for Europe than it is um, for the United States. And sorry not to get to any questions. And, and that was overly sharply phrased, but that was just a uh, limit of time. Um, I, th I think we may actually be able to take one or two questions. There's a question from Jonathan, Jonathan Austin, I'm going to put it personally on the, using the microphone. 
um, which actually uh, tallies with other questions that are in the chat. So, Jonathan, do you want to um, yeah. formulate it? Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's more a comment. Um, you know, Prakash described the apostasy of the IMF, and I think uh, if we go back to all the great and good in our uh, profession, there are many rounds of apostasy. One round contradicts the next and the next and the next. Um, I, I, I do wonder, you know, how we can be taken seriously um, at any given point in time on this issue. Um, the, the, the elephant in the room is low interest rates and that are expected to remain low for a while. But what does a while mean? Um, debt's going to need to be rolled over. This ton of debt is going to need to be rolled over for years and decades into the future. Um, and it's, is anyone seriously going to be predicting with any confidence what interest rates are going to uh, be like a decade from now and what the debt dynamics that result from that are, are going to be? I, I, I myself don't find that, that we can do that with any confidence. So that's my I think I might um, add one one comment personally, since I haven't said anything um, other than uh, cheerleading with all sides. I think the um, the point that Jason and allow me uh, and Larry are making is that this formula um, depend on a bunch of parameters, and you cannot apply a religious principle about you know debt sustainability without careful consideration of the trends and shifting trends in some of these underlying parameters. Uh, I think if COVID is going to go into 22, 23, there's going to be his, hysteresis effects on demand, and possibly supply that can affect, you know, growth interest rates, all the things that go into this recipe. And uh, when we, you know, give advice, Kiara said, you know, one has to be very careful uh, to have clear in mind, you know, where the direction is going to be and what the impact is going to be, you know, persistently on economy. So I think his point, I think, is valid. I mean, the, uh, one can discuss whether interest rates will be low forever or below G, but I think the point is is a point about the uh, the solidity of the advice, which should not be religious. It should be technically based on assumptions made on behavior. But um, Jason, you can come back to that. There's other questions here. If anybody wants to uh, unmute themselves and, and talk, if you have feel strongly to, I can take another question and then maybe Jason can say something about the long term yeah. Yeah. interest rate. Right. I'd say a few things. One is huge uncertainty in all of this. So I think you want to be cautious. I think the United States, for example, could easily have no problem. Um, stabilizing at 150% of GDP, our debt. But I wouldn't go there tomorrow. Um, I'd sort of test the waters more slowly and have an ability to just uh, keep a margin below our 2% target would be point number one. Point number two, a lot of the calls for fiscal adjustment actually aren't based on the amount of debt accumulated today. to date. They're based on projections of primary deficits in the future, often projections far into the future. And so the second thing I'd say is I would not tell a country, you undertake a big, huge, painful adjustment based on a forecast that's 25 years um, in the future. Um, the third thing I'd say is everything I did um, builds in a substantial increase in interest rates. I don't know, will they be higher than I said? Maybe, will they be lower than what I said? Um, maybe, but nowhere was I assuming that interest rates are staying where they are now or that R minus G is staying where it's been um, over the next decade. There's a some new version um, there. Just to check with you, Charles, uh, Charles Viplos, would you like to say a few words as well before we call it a day? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, a key point that uh, Jason made that we don't know about the where the R will be in the coming years and uh, and therefore one should uh, presume uh, that it will remain less than G. That's what I said. Uh, and there is no disagreement on that. The only thing I want to note is that the day when R flips above G, 
then we have a, a big problem if we are stuck with a very large debt. So Jason said with uncertainty, we should be prudent. That's exactly what I meant to say. Uh, but being prudent uh, means uh, not uh, taking it easy with uh, measures that are uh, not going to send the right signal uh, ahead of time, like the debt service. Uh, second point, uh, R minus G guaranteed stabilization. No, that is not true for any, any fiscal uh, uh, budget balance path. I can easily build all sorts of balanced budget path that will keep the debt rising faster than the R minus G. Well, only if the primary deficit keeps rising in an unbounded way. If the primary deficit stabilizes, then if R is less than G, the debt stabilizes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the problem with the experience we have in the U.S. and in Europe is that the, pub, uh, the, the, the balance budget didn't stabilize over the last 20 years. In effect, any times the debt service goes down, governments, most of them, not the German, but most governments jump on the occasion to keep increasing the deficit. So our, uh, the, 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 the term that is supposed to be stabilizing misses out the government reactions, which is the other part of the equation. And that's my concern, especially for Europe, is we shouldn't send signals saying, ah, as long as the debt service is small, you're in good shape. As long as R minus G is negative, don't worry, the debt will stabilize. It doesn't automatically. It's a, it's it's not a disagreement on the equation. It's a disagreement on the assumption that governments just put. Right. I mean, if you want to build in reaction functions, the reaction function I build in is if your debt gets too high, you'll start to do something about it. Um, and that's what you've seen in a lot of countries. The debt starts to get too high, interest rates start to rise, and they ratchet down that primary deficit. It's not a problem; it ratchets up. That's One of the issues with PAYGO in the United States is when we've had high real interest rates, PAYGO has been enforced. And when we've had low ones and it shouldn't have been enforced, um, it hasn't been. So I think the reaction function cuts, uh, cuts both ways. Okay, let's, is, let's leave room for the others to our... Uh, to this, I think it was a, a very exciting uh, seminar. Uh, it, it's really promising for, we had over, in excess of 300 people listening in, and uh, I think it was a great exchange. Good exchanges made good economics, and that's where we all need to sc continue to scratch our heads. Thanks, Jason. Thanks so much, Charles, well, and Kiara. Prakash, everybody have a, a great rest of the day, wherever you are. Stay safe. And uh, for those of uh, the colleagues that couldn't take part, we have taped this. You can find it posted on the IO website if uh, they've missed it. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Nicolette.